Section 2 It is now easy to understand the full meaning of the term the house of Monsieur Grandet, that cold, silent, pallid dwelling standing above the town and sheltered by the ruins of the ramparts. The two pillars and the arch which made the porte cochere on which the door opened were built, like the house itself, of tufa, a white stone peculiar to the shores of the Loire, and so soft that it lasts hardly more than two centuries. Numberless irregular holes, capriciously bored or eaten out by the inclemency of the weather, gave an appearance of the vermiculated stonework of French architecture to the arch and the side walls of this entrance, which bore some resemblance to the gateway of a jail. Above the arch was a long bas-relief in hard stone representing the four seasons, the faces already crumbling away and blackened. This bas-relief was surmounted by a projecting plinth, upon which a variety of chance growths had sprung up yellow pellitory bindweed convolvuli nettles plantain and even a little cherry tree already grown to some height the door of the archway was made of solid oak brown shrunken and split in many places though frail in appearance it was firmly held in place by a system of iron bolts arranged in symmetrical patterns a small square grating with close bars red with rust filled up the middle panel and made as it were a motive for the knocker fastened to it by a ring which struck upon the grinning head of a huge nail this knocker of the oblong shape and kind which our ancestors called jacquemart looked like a huge note of exclamation an antiquary who examined it attentively might have found indications of the figure essentially burlesque which it once represented and which long usage had now effaced through this little grating intended in olden times for the recognition of friends in times of civil war inquisitive persons could perceive at the farther end of the dark and slimy vault a few broken steps which led to a garden picturesquely shut in by walls that were thick and damp and through which oozed a moisture that nourished tufts of sickly herbage these walls were the ruins of the ramparts under which ranged the gardens of several neighboring houses the most important room on the ground floor of the house was a large hall entered directly from beneath the vault of the porte cochere few people know the importance of a hall in the little towns of anjou touraine and berry the hall is at one and the same time antechamber salon office boudoir and dining-room it is the theatre of domestic life the common living-room there the barber of the neighbourhood came twice a year to cut m grandet's hair there the farmers the cure the under-prefect and the miller's boy came on business this room with two windows looking on the street was entirely of wood gray panels with ancient mouldings covered the walls from top to bottom the ceiling showed all its beams which were likewise painted gray while the space between them had been washed over in white now yellow with age an old brass clock inlaid with arabesques adorned the mantel of the ill-cut white stone chimney-piece above which was a greenish mirror whose edges beveled to show the thickness of the glass reflected a thread of light the whole length of a gothic frame in damascened steel-work the two copper-gilt candelabra which decorated the corners of the chimney-piece served a double purpose. By taking off the side branches, each of which held a socket, the main stem, which was fastened to a pedestal of bluish marble tipped with copper, made a candlestick for one candle, which was sufficient for ordinary occasions. The chairs, antique in shape, were covered with tapestry representing the fables of La Fontaine. It was necessary, however, to know that writer well to guess at the subjects, for the faded colors and the figures blurred by much darning were difficult to distinguish. At the four corners of the hall were closets, or rather buffets, surmounted by dirty shelves. An old card table in marquetry, of which the upper part was a chessboard, stood in the space between the two windows above this table was an oval barometer with a black border enlivened with gilt bands on which the flies had so licentiously disported themselves that the gilding had become problematical on the panel opposite to the chimney-piece were two portraits in pastel 
supposed to represent the grandfather of madame grandet old monsieur de la bertelliere as a lieutenant in the french guard and the deceased madame gentillet in the guise of a shepherdess the windows were draped with curtains of red gros de tour held back by silken cords with ecclesiastical tassels this luxurious decoration little in keeping with the habits of monsieur grandet had been together with the steel pier-glass the tapestries and the buffets which were of rosewood included in the purchase of the house by the window nearest to the door stood a straw chair whose legs were raised on casters to lift its occupant madame grandet to a height from which she could see the passers-by a work-table of stained cherry wood filled up the embrasure and the little armchair of eugenie grandet stood beside it in this spot the lives had flowed peacefully onward for fifteen years in a round of constant work from the month of april to the month of november on the first day of the latter month they took their winter station by the chimney not until that day did grandet permit a fire to be lighted and on the thirty first of march it was extinguished without regard either to the chills of the early spring or to those of a wintry autumn a foot-warmer filled with embers from the kitchen fire which la grande nanon contrived to save for them enabled madame and mademoiselle grandet to bear the chilly mornings and evenings of april and october mother and daughter took charge of the family linen and spent their days so conscientiously upon a labor properly that of working women that if eugenie wished to embroider a collar for her mother she was forced to take the time from sleep and deceive her father to obtain the necessary light for a long time the miser had given out the tallow candle to his daughter and la grande nanon just as he gave out every morning the bread and other necessaries for the daily consumption la grande nanon was perhaps the only human being capable of accepting willingly the despotism of her master the whole town envied monsieur and madame grandet the possession of her la grande nanon so called on account of her height which was five feet eight inches had lived with monsieur grandet for thirty-five years though she received only sixty francs a year in wages she was supposed to be one of the richest serving women in saumur those sixty francs accumulating through thirty-five years had recently enabled her to invest four thousand francs in an annuity with maitre cruchot this result of her long and persistent economy seemed gigantic every servant in the town seeing that the poor sexagenarian was sure of bread for her old age was jealous of her and never thought of the hard slavery through which it had been won at twenty-two years of age the poor girl had been unable to find a situation so repulsive was her face to almost every one yet the feeling was certainly unjust the face would have been much admired on the shoulders of a grenadier of the guard but all things so they say should be in keeping forced to leave a farm where she kept the cows because the dwelling-house was burned down she came to saumur to find a place full of the robust courage that shrinks from no labor le pere grandet was at that time thinking of marriage and about to set up his household he espied the girl rejected as she was from door to door a good judge of corporeal strength in his trade as a cooper he guessed the work that might be got out of a female creature shaped like a hercules as firm on her feet as an oak sixty years old on its roots strong in the hips square in the back with the hands of a cartman and an honesty as sound as her unblemished virtue neither the warts which adorned her martial visage nor the red brick tints of her skin nor the sinewy arms nor the ragged garments of la grande nanon dismayed the cooper who was at that time still of an age when the heart shudders he fed shod and clothed the poor girl gave her wages and put her to work without treating her too roughly seeing herself thus welcomed la grande nanon wept secretly tears of joy and attached herself in all sincerity to her master who from that day ruled her and worked her with feudal authority 
nanon did everything she cooked she made the lye she washed the linen in the loire and brought it home on her shoulders she got up early she went to bed late she prepared the food of the vine dressers during the harvest kept watch upon the market people protected the property of her master like a faithful dog and even full of blind confidence obeyed without a murmur his most absurd exactions in the famous year of eighteen eleven when the grapes were gathered with unheard-of difficulty grandet resolved to give nanon his old watch the first present he had made her during twenty years of service though he turned over to her his old shoes which fitted her it is impossible to consider that quarterly benefit as a gift for the shoes were always thoroughly worn out necessity had made the poor girl so niggardly that grandet had grown to love her as we love a dog and nanon had let him fasten a spiked collar round her throat whose spikes no longer pricked her if grandet cut the bread with rather too much parsimony she made no complaint she gaily shared the hygienic benefits derived from the severe regime of the household in which no one was ever ill nanon was in fact one of the family she laughed when grandet laughed felt gloomy or chilly warmed herself and toiled as he did what pleasant compensations there were in such equality never did the master have occasion to find fault with the servant for pilfering the grapes nor for the plums and nectarines eaten under the trees come fall to nanon he would say in years when the branches bent under the fruit and the farmers were obliged to give it to the pigs to the poor peasant who in her youth had earned nothing but harsh treatment to the pauper girl picked up by charity grandet's ambiguous laugh was like a sunbeam moreover nanon's simple heart and narrow head could hold only one feeling and one idea for thirty-five years she had never ceased to see herself standing before the wood-yard of monsieur grandet ragged and barefooted and to hear him say what do you want young one her gratitude was ever new sometimes grandet reflecting that the poor creature had never heard a flattering word that she was ignorant of all the tender sentiments inspired by women that she might some day appear before the throne of god even more chaste than the virgin mary herself grandet struck with pity would say as he looked at her poor nanon the exclamation was always followed by an undefinable look cast upon him in return by the old servant the words uttered from time to time formed a chain of friendship that nothing ever parted and to which each exclamation added a link such compassion arising in the heart of the miser and accepted gratefully by the old spinster had something inconceivably horrible about it this cruel pity recalling as it did a thousand pleasures to the heart of the old cooper was for nanon the sum total of happiness who does not likewise say poor nanon god will recognize his angels by the inflections of their voices and by their secret sighs there were very many households in saumur where the servants were better treated but where the masters received far less satisfaction in return thus it was often said what have the grandes ever done to make their grand nanon so attached to them she would go through fire and water for their sake her kitchen whose barred windows looked into the court was always clean neat cold a true miser's kitchen where nothing went to waste when nanon had washed her dishes locked up the remains of the dinner and put out her fire she left the kitchen which was separated by a passage from the living-room and went to spin hemp beside her masters one tallow candle sufficed the family for the evening the servant slept at the end of the passage in a species of closet lighted only by a fanlight her robust health enabled her to live in this hole with impunity there she could hear the slightest noise through the deep silence which reigned night and day in that dreary house like a watchdog she slept with one ear open and took her rest with a mind alert a description of the other parts of the dwelling will be found connected with the events of this history 
though the foregoing sketch of the hall where the whole luxury of the household appears may enable the reader to surmise the nakedness of the upper floors in eighteen nineteen at the beginning of an evening in the middle of november la grande nanon lighted the fire for the first time the autumn had been very fine this particular day was a fete day well known to the cruchotines and the grassinists the six antagonists armed at all points were making ready to meet at the grandes and surpass each other in testimonials of friendship that morning all saumur had seen madame and mademoiselle grandet accompanied by nanon on their way to hear mass at the parish church and every one remembered that the day was the anniversary of mademoiselle eugenie's birth calculating the hour at which the family dinner would be over maitre cruchot the abbe cruchot and monsieur c de bonfons hastened to arrive before the des grassins and be the first to pay their compliments to mademoiselle eugenie all three brought enormous bouquets gathered in their little greenhouses the stalks of the flowers which the president intended to present were ingeniously wound round with a white satin ribbon adorned with a gold fringe in the morning monsieur grandet following his usual custom on the days that commemorated the birth and the fete of eugenie went to her bedside and solemnly presented her with his paternal gift which for the last thirteen years had consisted regularly of a curious gold piece madame grandet gave her daughter a winter dress or a summer dress as the case might be these two dresses and the gold pieces of which she received two others on new year's day and on her father's fete day gave eugenie a little revenue of a hundred crowns or thereabouts which grandet loved to see her amass was it not putting his money from one strong-box to another and as it were training the parsimony of his heiress from whom he sometimes demanded an account of her treasure formerly increased by the gifts of the bertelliers saying it is to be your marriage dozen the marriage dozen is an old custom sacredly preserved and still in force in many parts of central france in berry and in anjou when a young girl marries her family or that of the husband must give her a purse in which they place according to their means twelve pieces or twelve dozen pieces or twelve hundred pieces of gold the poorest shepherd girl never marries without her dozen be it only a dozen coppers they still tell in issoudun of a certain dozen presented to a rich heiress which contained a hundred and forty-four portuguese d'or pope clement the seventh uncle of catherine de medici gave her when he married her to henri the second a dozen antique gold medals of priceless value during dinner the father delighted to see his eugenie looking well in a new gown exclaimed as it is eugenie's birthday let us have a fire it will be a good omen mademoiselle will be married this year that's certain said la grande nanon carrying away the remains of the goose the pheasant of tradesmen i don't see any one suitable for her in saumur said madame grandet glancing at her husband with a timid look which considering her years revealed the conjugal slavery under which the poor woman languished grandet looked at his daughter and exclaimed gaily she is twenty-three years old to-day the child we must soon begin to think of it eugenie and her mother silently exchanged a glance of intelligence madame grandet was a dry thin woman as yellow as a quince awkward slow one of those women who are born to be downtrodden she had big bones a big nose a big forehead big eyes and presented at first sight a vague resemblance to those mealy fruits that have neither savour nor succulence her teeth were black and few in number her mouth was wrinkled her chin long and pointed she was an excellent woman a true la bertelliere l'abbe cruchot found occasional opportunity to tell her that she had not done ill and she believed him angelic sweetness the resignation of an insect tortured by children a rare piety a good heart an unalterable equanimity of soul made her universally pitied and respected 
her husband never gave her more than six francs at a time for her personal expenses ridiculous as it may seem this woman who by her own fortune and her various inheritances brought pere grandet more than three hundred thousand francs had always felt so profoundly humiliated by her dependence and the slavery in which she lived against which the gentleness of her spirit prevented her from revolting that she had never asked for one penny or made a single remark on the deeds which maitre cruchot brought for her signature this foolish secret pride this nobility of soul perpetually misunderstood and wounded by grandet ruled the whole conduct of the wife madame grandet was attired habitually in a gown of greenish levantine silk endeavouring to make it last nearly a year with it she wore a large kerchief of white cotton cloth a bonnet made of plaited straws sewn together and almost always a black silk apron as she seldom left the house she wore out very few shoes she never asked anything for herself grandet seized with occasional remorse when he remembered how long a time had elapsed since he gave her the last six francs always stipulated for the wife's pin money when he sold his yearly vintage the four or five louis presented by the belgian or the dutchman who purchased the wine were the chief visible signs of madame grandet's annual revenues but after she had received the five louis her husband would often say to her as though their purse were held in common can you lend me a few sous and the poor woman glad to be able to do something for a man whom her confessor held up to her as her lord and master returned him in the course of the winter several crowns out of the pin-money when grandet drew from his pocket the five-franc piece which he allowed monthly for the minor expenses thread needles and toilet of his daughter he never failed to say as he buttoned his breeches pocket and you mother do you want anything my friend madame grandet would answer moved by a sense of maternal dignity we will see about that later wasted dignity grandet thought himself very generous to his wife philosophers who meet the like of nanon of madame grandet of eugenie have surely a right to say that irony is at the bottom of the ways of providence after the dinner at which for the first time allusion had been made to eugenie's marriage nanon went to fetch a bottle of black currant ratafia from monsieur grandet's bedchamber and nearly fell as she came down the stairs you great stupid said her master are you going to tumble about like other people hey monsieur it was that step on your staircase which has given way she is right said madame grandet it ought to have been mended long ago yesterday eugenie nearly twisted her ankle here said grandet to nanon seeing that she looked quite pale as it is eugenie's birthday and you came near falling take a little glass of ratafia to set you right faith i've earned it said nanon most people would have broken the bottle but i'd sooner have broken my elbow holding it up high poor nanon said grandet filling a glass did you hurt yourself asked eugenie looking kindly at her no i didn't fall i threw myself back on my haunches well as it is eugenie's birthday said grandet i'll have the step mended you people don't know how to set your foot in the corner where the wood is still firm grandet took the candle leaving his wife daughter and servant without any other light than that from the hearth where the flames were lively and went into the bakehouse to fetch planks nails and tools can i help you cried nanon hearing him hammer on the stairs no no i'm an old hand at it answered the former cooper at the moment when grandet was mending his worm-eaten staircase and whistling with all his might in remembrance of the days of his youth the three cruchots knocked at the door is it you monsieur cruchot asked nanon peeping through the little grating yes answered the president nanon opened the door and the light from the hearth reflected on the ceiling enabled the three cruchots to find their way into the room ha you've come a greeting said nanon smelling the flowers excuse me messieurs 
cried grandet recognizing their voices i'll be with you in a moment i'm not proud i am patching up a step on my staircase go on go on monsieur grandet a man's house is his castle said the president sententiously madame and mademoiselle grandet rose the president profiting by the darkness said to eugenie will you permit me mademoiselle to wish you on this the day of your birth a series of happy years and the continuance of the health which you now enjoy he offered her a huge bouquet of choice flowers which were rare in saumur then taking the heiress by the elbows he kissed her on each side of her neck with a complacency that made her blush the president who looked like a rusty iron nail felt that his courtship was progressing don't stand on ceremony said grandet entering how well you do things on fete days monsieur le president when it concerns mademoiselle said the abbe armed with his own bouquet every day is a fete day for my nephew the abbe kissed eugenie's hand as for maitre cruchot he boldly kissed her on both cheeks remarking how we sprout up to be sure every year is twelve months as he replaced the candlestick beside the clock grandet who never forgot his own jokes and repeated them to satiety when he thought them funny said as this is eugenie's birthday let us illuminate he carefully took off the branches of the candelabra put a socket on each pedestal took from nanon a new tallow candle with paper twisted round the end of it put it into the hollow made it firm lit it and then sat down beside his wife looking alternately at his friends his daughter and the two candles the abbe cruchot a plump puffy little man with a red wig plastered down and a face like an old female gambler said as he stretched out his feet well shod in stout shoes with silver buckles the de grassins have not come not yet said grandet but are they coming asked the old notary twisting his face which had as many holes as a colander into a queer grimace i think so answered madame grandet are your vintages all finished said monsieur de bonfons to grandet yes all of them said the old man rising to walk up and down the room his chest swelling with pride as he said the words all of them through the door of the passage which led to the kitchen he saw la grande nanon sitting beside her fire with a candle and preparing to spin there so as not to intrude among the guests nanon he said going into the passage put out that fire and that candle and come and sit with us pardieu the hall is big enough for all but monsieur you are to have the great people are not you as good as they they are descended from adam and so are you grandet came back to the president and said have you sold your vintage no not i i shall keep it if the wine is good this year it will be better two years hence the proprietors you know have made an agreement to keep up the price and this year the belgians won't get the better of us suppose they are sent off empty-handed for once faith they'll come back yes but let us mind what we are about said grandet in a tone which made the president tremble is he driving some bargain thought cruchot at this moment the knocker announced the des grassins family and their arrival interrupted a conversation which had begun between madame grandet and the abbe madame des grassins was one of those lively plump little women with pink and white skins who thanks to the claustral calm of the provinces and the habits of a virtuous life keep their youth until they are past forty she was like the last rose of autumn pleasant to the eye though the petals have a certain frostiness and their perfume is slight she dressed well got her fashions from paris set the tone to saumur and gave parties her husband formerly a quartermaster in the imperial guard who had been desperately wounded at austerlitz and had since retired still retained in spite of his respect for grandet the seeming frankness of an old soldier good evening grandet he said holding out his hand and affecting a sort of superiority with which he always crushed the cruchots 
mademoiselle he added turning to eugenie after bowing to madame grandet you are always beautiful and good and truly i do not know what to wish you so saying he offered her a little box which his servant had brought and which contained a cape heather a flower lately imported into europe and very rare madame des grassins kissed eugenie very affectionately pressed her hand and said adolphe wishes to make you my little offering a tall blond young man pale and slight with tolerable manners and seemingly rather shy although he had just spent eight or ten thousand francs over his allowance in paris where he had been sent to study law now came forward and kissed eugenie on both cheeks offering her a work-box with utensils in silver gilt mere showcase trumpery in spite of the monogram e g in gothic letters rather well engraved which belonged properly to something in better taste as she opened it eugenie experienced one of those unexpected and perfect delights which make a young girl blush and quiver and tremble with pleasure she turned her eyes to her father as if to ask permission to accept it and m grandet replied take it my daughter in a tone which would have made an actor illustrious the three cruchots felt crushed as they saw the joyous animated look cast upon adolphe des grassins by the heiress to whom such riches were unheard of m des grassins offered grandet a pinch of snuff took one himself shook off the grains as they fell on the ribbon of the legion of honor which was attached to the buttonhole of his blue surtout then he looked at the cruchots with an air that seemed to say parry that thrust if you can madame des grassins cast her eyes on the blue vases which held the cruchot bouquets looking at the enemy's gifts with the pretended interest of a satirical woman at this delicate juncture the abbe cruchot left the company seated in a circle round the fire and joined grandet at the lower end of the hall as the two men reached the embrasure of the farthest window the priest said in the miser's ear those people throw money out of the windows what does that matter if it gets into my cellar retorted the old wine-grower if you want to give gilt scissors to your daughter you have the means said the abbe i give her something better than scissors answered grandet my nephew is a blockhead thought the abbe as he looked at the president whose rumpled hair added to the ill grace of his brown countenance couldn't he have found some little trifle which cost money we will join you at cards madame grandet said madame des grassins we might have two tables as we are all here as it is eugenie's birthday you had better play loto altogether said pere grandet the two young ones can join and the old cooper who never played any game motioned to his daughter and adolphe come nanon set the tables we will help you mademoiselle nanon said madame des grassins gaily quite joyous at the joy she had given eugenie i have never in my life been so pleased the heiress said to her i have never seen anything so pretty adolphe brought it from paris and he chose it madame des grassins whispered in her ear go on go on damned intriguing thing thought the president if you ever have a suit in court you or your husband it shall go hard with you the notary sitting in his corner looked calmly at the abbe saying to himself the des grassins may do what they like my property and my brother's and that of my nephew amount in all to eleven hundred thousand francs the des grassins at the most have not half that besides they have a daughter they may give what presents they like heiress and presents too will be ours one of these days at half-past eight in the evening the two card-tables were set out madame des grassins succeeded in putting her son beside eugenie the actors in this scene so full of interest commonplace as it seems were provided with bits of pasteboard striped in many colors and numbered and with counters of blue glass and they appeared to be listening to the jokes of the notary who never drew a number without making a remark while in fact they were all thinking of m grandet's millions 
the old cooper with inward self-conceit was contemplating the pink feathers and the fresh toilet of madame des grassins the martial head of the banker the faces of adolphe the president the abbe and the notary saying to himself they are all after my money hey neither the one nor the other shall have my daughter but they are useful useful as harpoons to fish with this family gaiety in the old grey room dimly lighted by two tallow candles this laughter accompanied by the whir of nanon's spinning-wheel sincere only upon the lips of eugenie or her mother this triviality mingled with important interests this young girl who like certain birds made victims of the price put upon them was now lured and trapped by proofs of friendship of which she was the dupe all these things contributed to make the scene a melancholy comedy is it not moreover a drama of all times and all places though here brought down to its simplest expression the figure of grandet playing his own game with the false friendship of the two families and getting enormous profits from it dominates the scene and throws light upon it the modern god the only god in whom faith is preserved money is here in all its power manifested in a single countenance the tender sentiments of life hold here but a secondary place only the three pure simple hearts of nanon of eugenie and of her mother were inspired by them and how much of ignorance there was in the simplicity of these poor women eugenie and her mother knew nothing of grandet's wealth they could only estimate the things of life by the glimmer of their pale ideas and they neither valued nor despised money because they were accustomed to do without it their feelings bruised though they did not know it but ever living were the secret spring of their existence and made them curious exceptions in the midst of these other people whose lives were purely material frightful condition of the human race there is no one of its joys that does not come from some species of ignorance at the moment when madame grandet had won a loto of sixteen sous the largest ever pooled in that house and while la grande nanon was laughing with delight as she watched madame pocketing her riches the knocker resounded on the house door with such a noise that the women all jumped in their chairs there is no man in saumur who would knock like that said the notary how can they bang in that way exclaimed nanon do they want to break in the door who the devil is it cried grandet End of section two.